So I'm just going to share my my screen with everyone. So what you should see on my on on the screen is my Mac or Google Chrome. Um, and what we have here is Zybooks because that is our book and our instruction manual. It's where you have to do a good amount of work for the class. So um, I'm going to start, and we're going to talk about Zybooks, but I'm also going to use PyCharm starting tonight. Next week, you're going to have to have PyCharm downloaded and installed and talk about it. But I like to get started with that in the beginning of the class, partly because all of the instructors share the same instance of Zybooks, so I can't actually program in Zybooks. Um, but additionally, I want to get you guys used to PyCharm and how it works, because it's going to become an increasingly more, a tool that's increasingly used in the class. So what are we doing here? Well, we're talking about a computer programming language called Python. Um, and Python is a great language. When you start thinking about languages, it's one of the languages that employers love. Um, so what is a computer program? Well, it's input, process, and output. Input is usually data. So, so and what we're going to start this week when we're doing input is somebody is going to type in a piece of data a string or an integer, and we're going to do something with it. And then we're going to display what we've done with it. So input will be what somebody types in. Process will be what we do to it in Python. And output will be the result. So that, that's the basic flow of what a computer does, okay, what a computer program does. Be it, you know, a two-liner that we're going to write tonight, or be it Netflix or Pinterest, which are two huge users of Python. The concept is always the same. The other thing that we need to talk about is space and speed, because those are the two resources that you have for a computer. And I will go back to them, mostly space, um, as we go through the class. So let's talk about space. Every computer has a certain amount of space, has a certain amount of RAM, and has a certain amount of hard drive. What we are doing for the majority of this class is, use, uh, is writing our programs, and they're just going to sit in RAM, okay? But we have to carve out a piece of the computer so that we can store data. And that piece of the computer that we're carving out, that piece of RAM, is called a variable. And a variable is just a named place in memory that we store something. And we will look more at what we're storing in just a few minutes. But um, let's see. This is your first programming activity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my first programming activity. And I'm just, this is PyCharm, by the way, everyone. And I'm creating a new Python file, and I'm just going to say my first program. And that's all I do. So let me look. Let's go over PyCharm for a little bit. Here we just have, I created something called Module 1. It's a project, and a project is just a place to store my files. That's all it is. Um, and that must be something. Oh, that was the last one because it's the same name as the other one. Anyway, so I just created a program. Now you'll notice that there are some, you know, that there, are, there are no spaces, okay? You cannot have spaces in a name of anything in PyCharm. Um, so I have underscores, and it ends with a dot .py because it's a Python file. So what, what do I want to do? Well... The first thing I want to do is I want to define a variable. And I'm going to say my var equals this is a variable. Okay? Sorry, I have to configure my interpreter every time, and it really irritates me. Okay. So that's all I've done. I've just created a variable in Python, and I've told Python, let me make this a little bigger, sorry. Um, I've told Python 
that I want to put this piece of data into something called my var. Now, I could have called this x. I could have called it y. I could have called my variable Lisa. This is just a name. That's all it is. Now, some things to think about when you're reading a program. You know it is a variable if it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Okay? I can look at this code and read this code and know that my var is a variable name because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And for whoever comes back over the next couple weeks, you're going to get sick of hearing me say that because for the first three weeks, I'm going to say that every time we talk about a variable. You know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. But it becomes very important because you're not just writing code, you're going to have to go back and read code. Okay, and if you don't understand, learning how to programming isn't just learning keywords. It's about learning logic and it's learning how to understand what you're saying to the computer and this is part of it. So, I just created a variable. What can I do with that variable? Well, let's see what, uh, well, sorry. Zybooks then goes to talk about computational thinking and algorithms. What computational thinking and algorithms are, are the process flow. You're going to write a line of code that's going to be executed by Python. And then you're going to write another line of code that's going to be executed by Python. And so on and so forth. And though that series of code is basically your algorithm. And it can be two lines of code. And it can be 100,000 lines of code. Or it can be a million lines of code. Well, you wouldn't want an algorithm that's a million lines of code or 100,000. But anyway. Um, so that's all it is. It's a sequence of instructions that you have told the computer. And you have to learn to think like a programmer. And there's actually a book called Think Like a Programmer. It's a Python programming book. And it's pretty interesting. Um, so you're, you, and you, I find that the students a lot of time want to talk to a computer like they talk to their friends. And you can't. A computer's much more stupid than most people are. Uh, so you have to learn to break your thinking down. And that's what they're talking about when it comes to computational thinking. Programming using Python. OK, so we have Python can be interpreted or compiled. Well, what in the world does interpreted mean? Interpreted means that Python reads the line of code and then executes it, and then reads the next line of code and executes it, and reads the next line of code and executes it, rather than taking that code and turning it into a, a, a language that's closer to the machine. And when you're talking about a language like C or C++, you have to compile them before they can be run. In Python, you don't. In Python, you can compile it if you want, but you don't have to. You can run it right there. And you don't. there's no intermediate steps. Um, Python does have an interactive interpreter. We won't be using that much in this class. Um, so executing a program. Let me talk, show you about executing a program, even though there are some things that we haven't learned and that we will learn. So I'm going to have a two-line program. I'm going to say my var, and then I'm going to use something that we haven't learned yet, which is a print function, and I'm going to print my var. So I'm going to show you what an interpreter is. Right now, I, this red dot in PyCharm is a breakpoint. And there are two ways I can run things in PyCharm. I can just run it and see what happens, or I can step through the code. And I do a lot of stepping through the code so that we can see what happens. And when you get used to using this function called a debugger, which allows you to step through the code, it makes when you start getting into, in this class, more complex programs, it really does start to make it easier. So I'm going to hit this little debugger. Oops, my bad. I haven't actually told my configuration what it needs to run. So I'm going to go out here, and I'm going to run my first program. So now I'm going to debug, and what you will see is a blue line come up. 
And this blue line tells you where Python is at that moment in time. So right now, Python is at line one. I know it's at line one in PyCharm because it's where the blue line is. And it hasn't done anything yet. It's at line one. I haven't told it to do anything yet. It's just waiting right now in the debugger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to step over that line of code and watch down here under special variables. When I step over that line of code, all of a sudden this changes, and it's my var stir equal stir this is a variable. What happened is that Python just read that line of code and said, okay, I'm going to take this string and associate it with this. So whenever I type this, type my var in my code, I'm going to automatically know that it has, this is a variable in it. So I am now at line two, and just to let you know, we'll talk about it in a minute, print is for output, that whole pro input process output. Print is what you're going to use a lot in this class to give data back. So Zybooks will want you to use the print function. I'm going to want you to use the print function. So if I step over this, it's done. But when I look at the console, it has printed this as a variable. So that is what an interpreter is. It hits the line of code and runs it. Now the other way I can run things, by the way, in PyCharm is this little uh, triangle up here. And this will simply run it, and you will see this is a variable. It didn't stop anywhere because I didn't tell it to because I didn't use this little bug guy. I used this little triangle. Okay. Um, so the print function displays variables and, and anything to the console. So while we're most likely, you know, using a graphical user interface, which is what we have in front of us right now, in our class, we're not going to be playing with graphical user interfaces. We're going to be dealing with console and text input and output. Um, there are ah, comments. Comments are important. A lot of instructors like comments. And how do you do a comment? Well, here's how you do a comment. And what is a comment? A comment is a line of code that doesn't ever get run. It's just there so that we as humans can read it. Python will ignore it. It'll ignore it because it either has the pound sign in front of it or because we have done a multi-line comment, which is three single quotes. So let me show you what a comment is. We'll just go back to the debugger. And I still have my breakpoint at line one, but I also put one at line three. Now, when I do this, you will notice that we're starting at line three. And that's because anything with a, any line that starts with a pound sign in Python, the interpreter will ignore. So it has ignored line one and line two. I had a breakpoint. It didn't stop there. And it didn't stop there because it recognized, sorry, that there was pound sign because it's a comment. So if I continue, same thing happens. Um, here is somebody's first program, and you can run this. That's the nice thing about these. You can just run them and see what they do. Now, this is a pretty complex program. Hold on. Um, what? In lab 1.2, I seem to be failing the submission because of space, but I can't seem to find it. Um, when we get there, um, I promise, Michael, that we will look at this issue. I'm not going to share your code with the class or display it, but we will talk about Lab 1.10. Um, basic input and output. So we have input process and output. So how do we get data in to a Python function? And how do we tell anybody what we've done? Well, there are a couple of ways to do that. So print is the way we tell people what we've done. 
and you can do a whole lot of things. Now, there's a couple of things you want to look at because, you know, they're talking about comma and equal that here. And that's something you're going to have to use later. So print is for output, not for input. And one of the things that you're going to have to remember, and you'll use this a couple times through the class, is that I'm going to print this string and I'm just going to run this and I'm going to show you what the output looks like. So right now I have this is a variable and this is a string. Now how did this is a string get on the next line? I didn't tell it anything, I just did it. Well, that's because print, which by the way is called a function, and this function is given to us just by using Python. One of the nice things about Python is you get all kinds of stuff for just using the language. Print is one of those things. Print takes an argument and it ha I'll go through the format of it in just a second. I'll go back to the new line. Print automatically puts a new line. Now a new line is just a, a, a character that is a non-visual character. And that's what separates it. Maybe I don't want it separated. Maybe I want them all on the same line. So I can say end is, uh, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I can run it, and now they're on the same line. There's no space. There should have been a space, so I'll put a space here. And I'll run it again. So what I have is I have a function called print. Now how do I know this is a function as opposed to a variable? Well, to begin with, there's no equal sign. So it's not on the left hand side of a single equal sign. And then the next clue is I have a, whoops, I shouldn't have done that. I have an open parenthesis and then there's a matching closed parenthesis. That indicates a function. That always indicates a function. And the stuff in the middle are what are called arguments. Now, for what we're doing, we're, we're only going to have one or two arguments this week. And the argument is going to be a variable. It might be this end equal something else other than a new line. So that's important to remember because you're probably going to need it for a lab this week. Um, and that's what print is. It's a function. I know it's a function as opposed to a variable because there's no equal sign going on. It's not on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And I've got these parentheses. So that's how I read, how when I'm looking at Python, I know that it's a function. So we've talked about output. Um, and you can go through. And by the way, if you've gone through some of this and you have questions, let me know. Um, so we're going to go to this thing called basic input. Input is your friend. You're going to be using this a lot. Every single lab you do is going to use this input function. So we have to figure out how to use it and how to use it effectively. So input allows someone to uh, bring in data from a console. Okay, so um, I am going to do a new file and I'm going to call it simple input. Whoops, I didn't want that. File. I want a new Python file. There we go. Simple input. Okay, so okay. So input is a function. I know it's a function because I, I told you it's a function, but because it has parentheses. Um, and so what does input do? Well, input allows me to take um, something from the command line that I have typed in and get it into my program. Because right now, when I run this, it's just kind of running out there in memory. And right now, I don't have a way 
to tell it what to do. You know, usually when we're doing a graphical user interface, you're clicking with a mouse or you're typing with your thumbs or um, so, you know, a million different ways to input and we're used to graphical input. Um, for what we're doing in this class, we don't have the option of graphical input, so we have to do text-based input and this is how we do it. So I'm going to say and then print my INP. Okay. So I am going to, and Zybooks will not be happy if you do this, input a number. So let's see what happens when I just run this. Okay. Look down here at this console. Oh, sorry. Got to change that. I have to change in PyCharm what it's going to try and run. So I'm going to go to simple input. So I'm just going to run this. And when I run it, it says input a number, and I'm going to put 42. And then I'm going to hit the Enter key, because right now, Python is waiting for me to do something. It's waiting for me to input a number, or input something, and then hit the Enter key. And it won't, and that's what input does. That's what the input function does. It says, give the user this piece of information, and then wait. Wait until they hit the Enter key. So I am now hitting the Enter key on my keyboard, and it will print 42. That's fine. Now I'm going to do it again, and I'm going to say 1,000. And I'm going to hit the Enter key, and it'll print 1,000. Now something you'll notice is that the number 42 and the number 1,000 are nowhere in this code. Nowhere do they exist in this code. They don't have to exist in the code. Because I'm writing code that is driven by the data I put in. So I don't, it doesn't have to be 42. It can be anything. I can say input a string. So I'm just going to change the code a little bit. And I'm going to input a string. And the string is Lisa. And I'm going to hit the enter key. And Lisa comes out. Because what has happened is that when I have typed this on the console and then hit the Enter key, Python has taken that stuff that I typed on the keyboard and put it in to a variable called my INP. And then when I use the variable my INP, it goes and it grabs that piece of information that I typed in as Lisa, and it pulls it out of memory, and it outputs it to the screen. So let's keep going. Um, errors. Errors happen all the time. I make errors all the time. Everybody that programs, programs with errors. Okay? So let me show you a couple of common errors. And um, we'll just go back to my first program. And let me hit the configuration because I want to run it a few times with errors. So we've already seen that this works, but there are ways that I can do errors. I can do that. All I did was remove a quote. And now I'm going to run this, and I get this big red thing at the bottom here. And it says, syntax error, EOL while scanning string literal. What in the world does that mean? What that means is that you're missing a matching quote because quotes and parentheses have to be balanced. If you have one that opens, you have to have one that closes. And that's the way it has to be. So that's what this is telling you. Now, computer programmers write computer programs. And you know what? We're notoriously bad for writing um, error messages that make any sense. So when I put that quote back, I'm back to running just fine. Same thing here. It says print this as a string. If I add another quote, another uh, parenthesis to that and run it, I now am getting syntax error unmatched closing parenthesis. And that's all fine and good until you start to get, will this one do it? Uh, print. This is a string. So this is one of the things that's most maddening for errors with students, okay? 
this says print this is a string and that there's an invalid syntax here and most people look at this and say there's nothing wrong with that line of code what is wrong with line 5 I don't see anything wrong with line 5 and that's because there isn't anything wrong with line 5 there is however a problem with line 4 the way the Python interpreter and most interpreters are written is they can't tell you that this closing parenthesis isn't there but they will detect that it's not there on the next line so at that point they will report the error and it can be frustrating and it can be confusing if you're looking at a line of code and you're sure that line of code doesn't have an error in it look at the line before it or the line before that somewhere in that chain of code there is an error so this is error handling and it can be extraordinarily frustrating don't beat yourself up about it don't get upset about it reach out to your instructor for my students definitely reach out to me and ask me send me if you're in my class and you have a question if you're like doing Zybooks and activity or lab take a screen capture of your code take a screen capture of the error and email it to me and I can usually help you figure things out pretty quickly um, so this just goes over common syntax errors and we basically just did that um, don't worry about syntax errors especially if you're in PyCharm Zybooks isn't as good but if you're in PyCharm PyCharm is going to tell you even too much it's going to tell you that there is a problem okay you'll see this little red line right here and it's telling you that there's a problem uh, Zybooks is not as good but don't get too frustrated um, logic errors are the errors that um, basically we make because we're not thinking enough like a computer uh, a logic error is uh, you just haven't put the, the instructions in the right sequence style guidelines you can read the style guidelines they will tell you how best to style your code there is something called flavor and function and style guidelines are flavor they're they're what industry standards say the best practices are I'm not going to worry about them too much I'm going to worry about more about your code works but for those people who are not in my class you're probably going to want to talk um, you're going to want to see what your instructor wants <clears throat> spaces and cases matter in Python okay so when I am in Python here is my my little program and I've defined a variable called my var now if I and everything works let's just run it everything works but instead of having a capital V here I must type a lowercase v well first of all PyCharm is giving me a red line but then I get this name my var is not defined well, what do you mean my var is on three well no my var is not on three uh, Python is a case and space sorry Python is case sensitive and space delimited so case sensitivity means that my var with a lowercase v and my var with an uppercase v doesn't aren't the same thing they're two completely separate things this becomes the variable that I created earlier when I have a capital V now spaces matter and we'll get more into that later but um, well new lines also matter so I have my three lines they're running again if I do this and I take this line and I put it here anybody think that's going to run because I don't think it's going to run Python says there's invalid syntax but I just took two lines that were working and combined them into one well that's because 
when you're done with a line of code that is expected to execute in the interpreter, you have to hit the enter key and do the next line and do the next statement on a new line. And then the next statement is on another new line. So it is very important. And then when we get in to module three and we start doing uh, branching, you, it's going to even get more complex. So be very careful. Also, right now, everything in this file is left justified. It's all at column zero. If I hit the enter key right there and run this, I'm going to have unexpected indent. So all I did was add a space. And that's because Python is a space delimited language. That space, as far as Python is concerned, needs to mean something. And right now, it doesn't mean anything, and Python doesn't like it. So Python will stop executing, because that's what just happened. It just stopped executing. And so just remember that. In weeks one and two, we don't deal with it as much. But in week three, it kind of hits you over the head. So um, here's just an example that you guys can go through. This is output art. It's just some practice. Lab. OK, lab one, and we'll talk a little bit about this. Basically, what they want is they want four inputs, OK? And then they want this to print out with whatever your inputs were. So let's, let's kind of do lab 1.9, because I usually do this one or two of the labs for module one. By the time we get to three, we'll be going over pseudocode, and I won't actually be coding any labs. So I'm going to do lab 1.9. And what is it telling us? So let me just go back here. And I'm going to copy all of this. And I'm going to show you how to do another comment. So I just put all this stuff in there. It's not Python code, and that's OK. So I'm going to do three single quotes, and then three single quotes. And that makes a multi-line comment in Python. So Python's going to ignore everything from the starting three quotes to the ending three quotes. And then I'm going to copy in this. Because that's the line of code. Python, uh, Zybooks is giving us this line of code. Now, what does it want us to do? Um, so basically, they want us to provide four words. And then those four words are going to be printed on this line. Now right now if I tried to print if I tried to run this program, I would it would not work because I didn't have my configuration set up. Whoops. My apologies. Let's do that again. Okay. So I'm going to run this and I get an error that first name is not defined and that's true. First name, what they want is they want a variable called first name, and they want someone to have entered first name. So I need to create a variable, and I need to accept input from the command line. Well, we know how to do those two things. So they want a variable called first name. Well, that's easy. First underscore name, and then I'm going to have an equal sign. Now, I want to gather input from external to the program. So I'm going to use the input function. Now, I'm not going to put anything in the input function. And when you're dealing with Zybooks Zy labs, you will not be putting anything in, in between those parentheses. When you're dealing with your own project later on, you're going to need to put stuff in there. But for right now, we're just going to put input in there. So I have defined a variable called first name, and I've given the user an opportunity to put something in. Now the same thing's going to happen for generic location. I'm just going to copy it so I don't type it wrong. And they want us to put input. And then whole number, same thing. 
and plural noun, same thing. And now I have a, a program that might work. So we're going to give this a try with Eric Chipotle 12 and Cars. And I'm going to debug it so we can actually see what's happening. I'm going to go over here to the console. And right now it's waiting for me to do something. So I'm going to step over. It's waiting for me to input something. And I'm going to put in Eric. And now it's on the next one, and I'm going to do Chipotle. Whoops, sorry. Had to step over. Actually, I'm just going to continue. Um, I'm just going to run it. Sorry, I shouldn't have made it more complex. So it's waiting for a first name, so I'm going to say Eric. The next is the generic location. I can type. Oh, wait a minute. Number, oh, don't do what I just did. My apologies. Okay, let's do this again. Eric. Oops. Chipotle, 12, and cars. So Eric went to Chipotle to buy 12 different types of cars. Well, why couldn't I just make that a whole line? Why couldn't I just say Eric, blah, 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 and just print it out as a string? Because I can do more with this. I can say Millie home, whole number is 42, and a plural noun is dogs. And now I can say Millie went home to buy 42 different types of dogs. So this is data driven, and this becomes more important as you move through the class. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So this is the one we had a question about, basic output with variables. Okay. So let's just make another file. Oops. Come on. A new Python file, lab 110. What is lab 110 asking? So let's go through and talk about this. Um, a variable like user num can store a variable, a value like an integer. Extend the given program as indicated. Output the user's input. Output the input squared and cubed, compute squared as user num times user num, get a second user input into user num2, and output the sum and product. Okay? So here's what they want us to do. And I'm just going to put it in a quote so we have it here. And then here's what they're giving us. Okay, so they're getting us started with this. Okay, so output the user's input. Well, we already know how to do that. When we want to output, we do print. And we know that the user's input was stored in the variable user num. We know user num is a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. So I want to output that. And if I run this, I'm going to enter an integer. Whoops, my bad. Add a configuration. Oops. Okay. Let's try this again. I'm going to run this. And it's going to enter an integer. And I'm going to say 42. And it's going to output the integer. So now it wants us to output the input squared and cubed. So squared is user num, user num times user num. And cubed would be user num times user num times user num. So I'm going to leave that one to you guys because I think you can figure that out. If you have a specific question, let me know. And then they want to get a second user input into user num2 and output the sum and product. So 
Um, I believe the sum is user num1 and user num2. Hold on. Let me stop sharing. I'm going to go look at look at something for a second because I'm confused by what they're asking. So let me stop sharing just really quick. Uh, and I want to look at something. So you should no longer be seeing my screen. And I just want to double check. Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen now. Um, just a second. There we go. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen now. And so the second part is about user num and user two. So, sorry, user num and user num two. So what they've asked us to do is they've asked us to create a second variable, user num2, and I'm going to make sure it's a variable because it's going to be on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, and I'm going to input, and right now I'm just not going to give it anything in the input command. Now one of the things they did here is they did a conversion, okay? And I'm sorry I didn't talk about this earlier, and I'll go back and talk about it. When you put something into Python, it's a string. Everything in Python is a string unless you tell Python differently. And a string is just something with quotes around it. And that's fine most of the time, but sometimes you've got to have integers and floats. The way you turn a string into an integer or into a float is by using a function. And in this case, we're using the int function. So the purpose of the int function is to change something from a string into an integer. So I have input here. But if I input, let me just show you. I say um, sum is user num plus user num num2, okay? And I run this, okay? So we got the first part. My integer is going to be 42. And then it's waiting for my second input. And I'm going to say 100. And all of a sudden I get an error. And an unsupported operand type for int and stir. So we know that user num is an int. But user num2 right now it thinks is a string because Python thinks everything's a string unless you tell it differently. So the way I can fix this is I can tell Python to expect an integer. So if I run this again, and I'm going to do 42, and I'm going to do 100, and uh, it didn't print out, sorry. Okay, so one more time, 42, 100, and it's going to give me 142. Now this is not the entire, um, the entire solution because you have to add some verbiage for Zybooks. So when Zybooks gives you this information, what it wants you to do is give it back in a certain way. So in this case, it says you entered colon four. So if you just do this line, it won't, you won't get credit for it. So what we're going to do is say you, and is that right? Okay, because I can concatenate strings in Python, and this is how I do it. Well, there's a couple of different ways, but this is the easiest way. It's going to say, you entered, so I am mimicking what they said here, you entered colon space four. So when I run this, I now get, enter an integer, 42. Okay. Oh, my bad. 
So this is another beautiful little error message. It says you cannot con you can only concatenate stir, not int to stir. Because user num is an integer, I can't add it to a string. I can only add it to another integer. So what do I do? Well, I turn it into a string. I tell Python, for this moment, I want you to turn this into a string so I can add these two together and create another line. So if I run it, and it says you entered 42. And then you'll get credit for doing that in Zybooks. So then Zybooks has 4 squared is 16. So at that point, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to use user num, and you're going to want to say user num times user num is. And then you're going to say squared is 16. And again, you're going to have to remember to use that stir. So, Michael, have I answered your question? Oh, your code's not there. I'm going to look at this. Okay. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Zybooks isn't great when it comes to spaces. Um, I haven't looked at your code, but there's a potential that that there is a space after the double quote. Okay. And user num cubed is is that little I there? It shouldn't be. Is this a direct copy? That's fine. Accidents happen. Because if this is a direct copy, it looks like there's a space right there. That's what it looks like to me. So that would be the first thing I would look at. It was a direct copy. Okay. So th is there a space there? Because that looks like a space. The, what Zybooks is telling you is that it's catching a space there with, that it is, it is not expecting. And um, so I would have to look, yeah. So between the last exclamation, exclamation and the uh, quote, it looks like there's a space, but I can't tell. So, okay, one more thing. Okay, so there is. There shouldn't be. Remove that space. Remove the space to the right of the last exclamation point. You only want a space before the first exclamation point. So variables and assignments. Um, Variables basically are there to hold values. That's their entire, their entire reason for being. And it may not seem clear now, but later on, it's, it's extremely important how you manage your variables. Um, again, we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, and that is what is important. So you're always, your variable's always on the left-hand side. Always. It will never be on the right-hand side. You will never say 5 equal x. You will always say x equal 5. Um, let's see. Identifiers. Um, so a name. What can you... So rules for identifiers. Rules for naming variables. Okay. And these are just it. You can, you can have upper and lowercase characters, you can have underscores, and you can have digits 0 through 9, and that's it. And you got to start with uh, a character. You can't start with a number. And Python is case sensitive, just like we talked about. So be careful. Students get very frustrated when they're looking at their code and they see the word age, 
and then they see it again with you know lowercase it's defined it's defined as age with a lowercase a and then later on they type it as age with a capital A they can't figure out why their code isn't working and it's not working because of that capitalization um, Python has a few keywords and those keywords are important because you can't use them for variable names you cannot have a variable named rise you cannot have a variable named class or continue or any of these words okay so that's why keywords are important plus they, they tell Python to do something very very specific and that's why they're a keyword so if you you know define a variable in your function your Python code is not going to work numeric types there are two types of numerics in Python there's an integer and a floating point and a float the difference a float has a decimal place with something after it and int does not have a decimal point that's the entire difference um, just like we converted an int using the int function an integer using the int function from a string to an int we can do the same thing with a float and you will be using that um, and you know they're nice little Python function for e equals mc squared just to show you um, how to use a float and here they're talking about float and overflow um, I don't really use this I, I haven't if you're doing mathematical and scientific calculations you might arithmetic expressions okay and it's kind of sad that they expected you to use it in 1.10 before they introduced you but here they are addition subtraction multiplication division exponent and there's also another one that they don't really talk about here but it's called the floor operator and you're going to need it in module three um, and basically they just do what they look like you can add you can subtract you can multiply you can divide there's an order as well this is the order of how things happen in an alphanumeric expression and the only thing that can change that order is parentheses we will not be doing a lot of uh, complex mathematical calculations in this class if we do do some they usually give you a good hint as to what they are um, here are the precedence rules parentheses take precedence over everything um, the urinary operator is used I'm sorry yeah the unary operator is used for negation um, the next is multiply division and modulo um, don't worry we'll discuss modulo later um, then plus and minus and then um, left to right that's how it's read so those are um, and, and they're exactly like you do in math they, they're exactly like algebra it's, it's all the same they do not change the rules um, in Python a Python expression so an expression in Python is is um, yeah an expression in Python is just a statement okay and it can be any kind of a statement now one thing that they're talking about here is the format function and we'll talk a little bit about that later when we do an example or in a little bit when we do an example because it's getting close to 10 um, let's see division and modulo okay division is division it's just a slash and it can um, it will the result will usually be a float and then there's this floor operator remember the floor operator because you're going to need this later um, in in module three and the floor operator basically just says only return me a whole number I don't want a float so if it's 10.5 only give me the 10 part I don't want the 0.5 so that's what the floor operator does um, and it basically just gives you a whole number back it does not give you any part of a number it doesn't give you the decimal place um, 
And in module three, students are like, where did they tell us about the floor operator? And it's like in this one paragraph in module one. Um, module basics. So um, OK. So what we're talking about usually is called a script. That's what we're doing here in this class. There are Python instances. Or there are companies who use Python that have millions of lines of code. Think Pinterest. Netflix uses Python for a lot of their code and their programming. That's millions of lines of code. You can't manage millions of lines of code in a single script. It will not work, okay? Mostly because you've got to have a lot of different programmers, and you want to encapsulate. If you're going to break something, you want to break it in the smallest place possible. So there are things called modules, and modules are just scripts that you can import into another script. So there's a math module in Python. There are game programming modules in Python. Pygame is a Python gaming module that you can import and get all kinds of code that somebody else has written and lots of people have tested and it's free. So <laughs> modules are beautiful things and they really do help you um, carve out your code. So the math module is important, and it's very handy. You can square things. You can do a square root. You can do all kinds of exponentiation using the math module. And these are just some of the common functions that they give you. Um, and if you want to know, and some teachers don't like it when I do this, but it's important. So if I want to Google Python math module, I get all kinds of free documentation that tells me all these things about it, okay? If I want to Google Python input function, again, I can go out and find WC, W3Schools, and the Python documentation itself is really good. So, um, text. Sorry about that. So here we're just talking about how text is. Now there's ASCII and Unicode. Um, and basically what they're saying is that every single character has a corresponding decimal, play, decimal to it. And that decimal is how the computer actually looks at that letter. The computer doesn't know X. The computer actually knows the binary for 88. That's all it's telling us. Um, Oh, and here are common escape sequences because they mean something to the computer, so you have to be careful with things. This is how you get a new line in a string. This is how you get a tab in a string, but you may have to escape. If I want a backslash in a string, I have to put two backslashes. So that's something to keep in mind. Here's just some number games, divide by x. So um, this is basically just using the math module. It using integers and x as input and output the user num divided by x three times. So that is just straight math. And then calories burned during a workout. Now luckily they're giving you the fun the um calculation here and what they want is they want you to take four inputs and then they want you to use those four inputs to calculate the calories burned. Does that make sense to everyone or do we need to go through that a bit? Okay, we're good. Um, and then variables, input, and type conversion. So this is where we deal with changing it from a string to an integer, an integer to a float, a float to a string. 
or sorry, um, floats are integers to a string. So, and there are three parts to this, and so it can be a little bit, whoops, my bad. It can be a little bit confusing for students. Now, here's where I suggest students take baby steps. Get one thing working, and then try another thing, and then try another thing. Because this has three different requirements. So you're going to put an input, but, um, an integer between 32 and 126, a float, a character, and a string, storing each into separate variables, and then you output those. Okay? And then you're going to output the reverse of those. And then you're going to convert the integer into a character using the care function and output that character. Okay? So, and that's because you have that table that we looked at where every, uh, um, every character is really a number. So that takes us through module one. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this and the scripts up on my YouTube channel and I'll be sending out an email to the other professors and for my students I'll be putting it in the announcements. Does anybody here need the link to the YouTube channel? Okay, okay, let me get that for you really quick. Oops, this is my YouTube. I don't want to do the discussion. There we go. And by the way, what you'll see here is I have playlists for the last four terms. So with Module 1, Module 2, Module 3, recordings of lectures. So if there's something you... You know, you can look at the other ones. You can look ahead. Um, there are some things as well on this that talk about, like this is um, a video I created for Module 2, Lab 2.12, that goes through um, the core competencies. I haven't created any more because the school has actually started to do those. But there are all kinds of things on here, including some things about what a variable is and things like that. So feel free to peruse. Um, this is the YouTube channel, so go ahead and copy that. Oh, wait a minute. This is to everybody. I didn't realize that. Okay. So there's the YouTube channel. Go ahead and copy that. And, um, and if you're looking, it's Prof. Lisa. And there are, just use the resources out here for whatever you need. No problem. You guys have a nice evening. I should have this up uh, tomorrow, if not tomorrow on Thursday. Usually the, uh, these are on um, Thursday nights. I couldn't do Thursday night this week, so Tuesday, but next week it will be Thursday night. So everybody have a good evening and I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop the recording and